Hi, I'm Randy Craighead, and I want to welcome you back to Biblical Foundations. And today, uh, we're going to go through Lesson 12. Can you believe that? We've gone through 12 lessons, and hopefully it's been good for you. And hopefully this last one, I think I'm going to pique your interest today. And it's going to be quite interesting because today, I'm going to talk about the end, the end times. And uh, there's a near end that all of us have, and then there's a far end that's coming. And so uh, I think it's going to be interesting. I've always been getting questions for many, many years about uh, many of these topics. What does this mean? I read this. I heard this. And so uh, I hopefully, I'm just, I'm just going to give you just a brief overview of some of that. But just for review, in Lesson 7, we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? How do we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as a believer? Lesson 8, we talked about faith. What does it mean to walk in faith, have faith? Lesson 9, we talked about doing life together? What does it mean to be in community with one another and to do life with each other? Lesson 10, we talked about giving. And lesson 11, we talked about go and tell. Go and tell. We, and so we talked about what does it mean to go out into the world and, and preach the gospel and tell other people about Christ. And today, I want to talk about the end. The end. In Matthew 24, 13 and 14, it says this, but he who endures to the end, Hopefully, you didn't have to, you're not saying, oh, I had to endure to the end of these lessons. Uh, but he who endures to the end shall be what? Saved. Saved to eternal life. Saved from hell, from damnation, and saved to eternal life. So if you endure to the end, and this gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God, will be preached, not may be preached, it will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And here's the thing. After all this happens, and then the end will come. The end will come. There's an end for all of us. But really, it's a beginning. But there's an end to all of us. And just to recap what we just read, there's the end of this age that is drawing near. And you look around in the world today and go like, oh, my Lord, Whew. Uh, Lord, come quickly, right? I mean, it's so much going on. It's so complex and nations and things and this and strife and division. And, whew, it's all over the place. And so uh, the end is drawing near, the end. This gospel must be preached first. We saw that the gospel is going to go around the world and preach. And it's so amazing that technology can happen a lot faster than we thought, than we used to think. And it's so, it's so incredible. Uh, and it has to go to all the world and all the nation. The gospel, the good news, is a witness to all the nations of who Christ is. And salvation is for those who endure in Christ, endure to the end. Or in other words, I'm just like, oh, I'm just barely making, I got to endure it. No, those that make it to the end. And so, and every person is without excuse. And we read that in the book of Romans. Every person is without excuse. And so it says in Romans 1.18, I want to bring this out because this is so important. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Who God is, you can see what Paul was saying here in Romans, you can see it through creation. Being understood by the things that are made, the created world. Even us, we're created beings. People can recognize God in you, in us, they can recognize his attributes through the creation and through the created being. Understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that they, the world, they're without excuse. That is a power, there's a lot in that scripture right there. And that's a powerful scripture. But in other words, the world's without excuse. But we have to go out. It doesn't give us an excuse not to go out. That's not what that means. We have to go out and preach the gospel like I talked about in the last lesson, in lesson 11. Now, the end. There is a, what I call the near end. And what's the near end for all of us have a near end, okay? And the near end for all of us is physical death. I mean, as I've gotten older or more mature, <laughs> I look at my body and my skin going like, hmm, you can tell that there is an, agent inside of me that I really don't want there, but there, there's, there's death inside of us. Then we age and we grow and we grow old. 
and you can't do anything about it. I wish I could. I wish I could. And I look at myself and I'm getting older. I look at my hair, I look at my face, I look at the wrinkles, I look at my hands, I look at my skin, my skin's not as thick as it used to be, and I look at spots and all this. And so where does that come from? There's death inside of us. And that comes, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Because they sinned, death reigned in our, reigns in our mortal body. And so there's, there is a near end for all of us. There's fear, physical death. And after physical death, there is an eternity. There's an eternity for us. Either it's heaven or it's hell. Uh, a place of separation from God. But here's the cool thing. We have the resurrection of the body. As a believer, there's a res- resurrection of a body. For, they're all, everybody's going to be resurrected at one point. But I want to talk about the resurrection of the body from a believer's standpoint. For someone who is born again, as you see in Scripture, which is amazing. That's this tremendous hope for us. So there is a near end, physical death, eternity, and there's the resurrection of the body. That's all in the near future uh, for us. Now, if you're 15 years old, don't freak out, okay? So, but you need to live, live ready like Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Now, I want to I uh, kind of expound on the near end, and I want to start with physical death, okay? What does the Bible say about death? What does the Bible say about what happens when we die as a believer, okay? So we see this, uh, a few, I wrote a few scriptures here. It's appointed in Hebrews, it's appointed for men to die once, but after the judgment. So we are gonna die once, and then after we die, there's, there's a judgment that's gonna take place. And that's, Jesus is gonna decide that. He is, he is the great judge, okay? And he's gonna decide that. Where, where do we spend eternity? But you can decide that right, right now, today. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, I'm good about living, but for me, I'd rather die. If I die, who cares? I'm gonna gain, I'm gonna gain what? I'm gonna gain everlasting life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna gain being with Jesus. I'm gonna gain being in heaven. There's no loss. There's no loss. The only loss is the people that are hanging around that let you left behind and they're just sad that you're gone. But for the, for the person who passes through eternity through that veil, that invisible veil, it's nothing but gain and as a believer. It's so cool. It's exciting. And so here's the thing. Paul did not fear death. As a believer, as a Christian, we should not fear death. We don't need to fear death. There's no reason for it. We don't want to die. We have our loved ones here. We want to stay as long as possible. And I do. I want to stay here as long as possible because I want to be with them. And plus, there's, there's, I have a job to do. I have a purpose. I want to tell people about Christ. I want to f- affect many people, as many people as I possibly can. So I'm not ready to go. I want to go at the appointed time, but I'm not ready to go now. And here in 1 Corinthians, Paul goes on. He says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And I'm going to tell you where death ends up at the end of this lesson. I mean, it's not in a good place, but it's a good thing. All right, so there's physical death. So we see even the great Daniel in the Old Testament, Jesus and Paul, here's, here's, here's the thing. They call death sleep. Isn't that cool? They call it sleep. In other words, when you sleep, what's going to happen? You're going to wake up at some point, right? You shouldn't sleep forever. So they call death sleep. And that's really what it is. But we, and so here's the scriptures for that in 1 Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed. They're trying to educate us. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are what? Asleep. That you may not grieve as others who do, who have no hope. I tell you, there's a big difference when you go to a funeral for a believer as opposed to a non-believer. When you go to a funeral for a non-believer, oh, it's just so tough. It's so tough on the family. Uh, and you just feel it. It's like, oh, wow, you know? And you know where this, this person really wasn't living right. And so, I mean, I mean we're not judging, but uh, based on their lifestyle, you can, just, you, you can tell the difference. But when you go to a funeral for a believer, man, it's, 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 it hurts, but you know they're in a better place. It's so exciting. And we talk about heaven and, and we talk about they're in eternal, they're in eternity with Christ. And it's only selfishness on our part that we really want him back and all those cool things we say. And so, uh, and so, so, so we have hope. We have hope when we die. <clears throat> and Daniel, verse 12, verse two, it says, 
And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, remember dust you shall, you shall return, but many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Woo, that's exciting. We're gonna wake up. <clears throat> some to everlasting life, amen. And some to shame, not good. And everlasting contempt, not good. So there is a dividing line. And here's Jesus. He said that is his beloved friend, Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus said that Lazarus had fallen asleep. Mary and Martha were all distraught. Lord, if you had just been here, if you'd just been here four or five days earlier, this wouldn't have happened. But now he's been dead for four days and now he's not, he stinks and it's not good. And Jesus said, hey, he's just fallen asleep. I tell you, when Jesus walks on the scene, anything can happen. It's amazing. And after these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to do what? Awaken him. Awaken him. Isn't that cool? That's just so cool. And, God, and, and Jesus raised him from the dead. Uh, now here's eternity. I want to talk about the difference, as we see in Scripture, between heaven and hell. There's an eternity for all of us. And, and there's, there's a great passage here that I want to read. It's so powerful. It talks about the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. And I'm going to read this, okay? And I want this to sink in. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus at the gate of his home covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. It's a place, a holding place in heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, or hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. If that, you can't get any clearer depiction, portrait, picture, however you want to say it, of the difference between heaven and hell. We see it here. It's so clear. There is a difference. There's a place of, uh, this clear distinction between heaven and hell. Heaven is a place of love and security. Lazarus was there in Abraham's bosom, a beautiful holy place. And hell, it was in heaven. And hell was a place of separation, torment, agony. It said he called far away across the chasm. Send Lazarus to come. And if he just put a cup, just some water on his finger and just touch my tongue, I shall be soothed. And so we see this huge difference. When we die as believers, we're in the presence of God. Amen. Praise God. You ought to run around the room there. Isn't that amazing? So when we die, we're immediately in the presence of the Lord. Instantly. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says this. We are confident, yes, well pleased. Paul's getting excited. Rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we're absent from this body, our soul, when we die, our physical body dies, immediately our soul and our spirit are going to go to heaven. I remember, this is so powerful. If you've ever been around if you've ever been with someone who's getting ready to cross over into eternity, I mean like right there, I've heard so many amazing stories. It's so incredible. They begin to see heaven. And I wasn't planning on saying this, but I just thought of it when I'm speaking here. I remember when my, my dad passed away and he was in a hospital and, and he had cancer. And, and the nurse said, you know, he's, he's in his final, final hours. And, and, I, and so we went, we were there in the room with him. And, and I remember I was there, it was me and the nurse and we, I was just standing there by him and he couldn't, he couldn't even talk. He was on oxygen, but this was so amazing. But he, he started 
sing. Hey, he hadn't talked in probably 24 hours. He started, he's got energy and he started singing this old hymn called Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. And he, and he, he, lived, he pushed himself up and he was looking forward and he kept, he kept singing, hold to God's unchanging hand, hold to God's unchanging hand. And I'm crying, the nurse is crying, going, oh my God. And she said, he's seeing heaven. He's seeing heaven. And I believe that. I believe he was right there. He was, he was in that land of in between, just right with, with heaven and earth. And heaven. he was right there and he was seeing it. And he was like trying to reach out. Isn't that powerful? I'll never forget that. And I'll say this. That's probably the closest I've ever been to heaven. <laughs> you know, standing right there by his side. You did, the closest you get to heaven is when you sit with somebody getting ready to die to the other side. I'm telling you, I'm, I mean that. That's, that's incredible. Anyway, I'm now I'm like preaching. So when we die as believers, we're in the presence of God. And I love this scripture. When we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. Or... And I love how it says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. And I put on here, or displeased and in the presence with the devil. <laughs> I just added that in there. And that's, that's kind of what happens, you know. It's, it's, it's not cool to be with the devil. So, um, so Paul had a vision, and a lot of Bible scholars believe this is when he was uh, on a mission, one of his missionary journeys, and he was in the city of Lystra, uh, one of the many cities he went through to preaching the gospel. And uh, this was in Asia Minor. And, and, uh, and so uh, there was a particular time he was there and he was preaching. And, uh, and the people in the city, some, some men in the city started stoning him. They stoned him and drug him out the city, out, outside the city gate and left him for dead. And a lot of Bible scholars believe that's when he, he, that he went to heaven, that he actually died and went to heaven. And shortly after that, he, 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 he was resurrected, rose again, and went back in the city and started preaching again. Talk about amazing. That was incredible. And he said this. So he wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And many Bible scholars believe this was the moment when he was, was stoned, left for dead outside the city gates in Lystra. And, he, and this is what he wrote. I know a man in Christ, he's talking about himself, who was caught up to the third heaven. Now, what's the third heaven? Well, the first heaven is where we live right now. It's what we see, touch, the three-dimensional world. We see it, our four-dimensional world, space-time continuum. It's where we live, the seats, the stage, the stage I'm standing on. This is, this is the first world, the atmosphere that we see. But there's a second world, and that's, where, that's the realm of angels and demons. It's the, angel, the angelic host of the Lord and the demons, the demonic hosts of the devil. And that's, that's the invisible world. We, we, don't, we don't see it. But there's a third heaven. There's, there's a heaven above that. And, and how do we know that? Because in Daniel, when he was on a, a fast for 21 days, he was fasting for 21 days, and it took 21 days to get the answer. And the angel came to him and said, Gabriel came to him and said, I mean, Michael came to him and said, I, I would have come earlier, but I was impeded I, by, by the prince of Persia. I was impeded by this prince and it was this dark, dark prince of the air and, and there was a match going on and he, 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 he pushed through and he, and he defeated that prince and he came down and delivered the answer to Daniel. And so we see uh, that there, so if you can deduce from that that there is a first heaven, a second heaven and then the third heaven is paradise. Paradise. The first what we see the second is the invisible realm. There's the visible realm. There's a lot more to, the, to, to, to this world than, than, we, than meets the eye. There's a lot we don't see. There's the invisible world uh, that we don't see. And then there's a place in heaven, the third heaven, we call paradise. And he goes, how I was caught up into what? Paradise. Into paradise. And I heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Wow. Isn't that incredible? So that's Paul's glimpse into heaven. Our father, Jesus, said this in John 14. He, 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 so Jesus is there preparing a place. Father God is preparing a place for us in heaven. And so he's talking about what does it look like when we get to heaven? And so in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says this, and I love this because 
because like Paul said, they were, it's inexpressible. You can't even write it down. It's so inexpressible what heaven is like. Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like. We can't imagine it. It's, just, it's going to be unbelievable. I look up at the stars at night and go like, wow, this is so incredible. And this is just, we're just seeing just a few stars that we can, our naked eye can see. But they say there's over 100, bil- 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. That's just, that's just amazing to me. And so, so, so anyway, so in our, in our Milky Way galaxy, it's so huge. And you're, we're just one of the, one of the solar systems in it. So you can't, I, it's impo- I has not seen that. We haven't seen it. We can see it through microscopes and, and deduce things, but eyes not seen it or ears heard. It's, it's, you're not going to believe it. We're not going to believe it when we go to heaven. And so uh, Jesus went on and said this in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There you go. I'm going to come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't it cool? So God, Jesus went away. And one of the things he's doing, he's, he's preparing a place for us. He's preparing a place for what? His bride. We are his bride. Okay, moving on. Now, so that was heaven. So let's talk a little bit about hell, okay? And I know like, oh my God, Pastor Rain, this is so heavy, Lord. But... As believers, we need to be aware of these things. I don't like to talk about hell either. You know, some people, I live in hell. <laughs> you don't live in hell, okay? Uh, it may be hell-like, uh, but it's not even hell-like. This is hell, okay? Because you're not eternally separated right now from, from God. You have the opportunity to, be, to know Christ. So hell, it's really, so hell was really, the Bible says, was really prepared for the devil and the angels, not for human beings, that hell, was, hell was not prepared for us. But unfortunately, that's where we go. Uh, if, if, you're, if you don't accept Jesus as, as your person, if you're not a believer, unbelievers, the wicked, they go to hell. So, but, in, but originally, it was really prepared for the devil and his angels, and that's what we see. Then Jesus, then he will also say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you're cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay? And then we, so we see in the end, Uh, There's going to be a a judgment, the great white throne judgment that's going to take place at the end of the age uh, where Jesus Christ is going to be sitting on the throne. He's going to be separating the goats from the sheep. Get the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. And he says, and this is what it says here in Matthew, Matthew 24 and 25. Jesus will sit on his throne separating the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. I know one thing. I want to be on the right-hand side of God, right? Uh, In more ways than one. Now, I want to talk about the resurrection. So that was a little bit about heaven, hell. I want to talk about the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, Christianity is literally quite dead. And I mean that. If there is no resurrection, what are we doing and basically, that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15. If there's no resurrection, then wow, what was me? And so all of our preaching is all in vain. Everything we're saying is in vain if there's no resurrection. Because that's the hope. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall yet live. Wow, isn't that awesome? The resurrection. And there's some false things out there about death. I want to bring this up real quick. There's false and erroneous teachings on death and resurrection. There's two, two primary teachings out there. There's a teaching called annihilism or annihilation. And it teaches that where it's the, where, where it's, it teaches the total destruction and non-existent nature of an eternal soul. In other words, you're, you're just like the animal kingdom. When you die, you return to the dust and it's over. There's no soul, there's no spirit. And a lot of people believe that. Yeah, when I die, I just go to the dust and that's it. There's, nothing, there's no afterlife, there's no judgment, there's just nothing. We were just here for a period of time and then we are absorbed into the earth. And that's it. Uh, 
And so that, that's, that, the Bible does not teach that, okay? Another one the Bible does not teach is reincarnation. And that is, that the reincarnation teaches that upon death, the soul transmigrates into a new body and typically into that of a different species, okay? And I know we make jokes you know, a lot of times, you know, man, you know, I hope I don't come back and be a roach. You know, if you did good, if you did good you'll come back and you'll be, you know, a really... A, a, better, a better animal, for, for example, or a better person. Or, or if you did really bad, you would come back and be a roach. Have to start all over again. Go through the series of evolutions, they say. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. The, these two are so, they are false, and the Bible doesn't teach that. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, judgment. All right, so Paul says this about the resurrection. It's our final victory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it, I would encourage you uh, even as you're going through your workbook, you're going to see there's a lot of scripture there. But just go read uh, the latter part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's really powerful. And I'm going to give you uh, uh, four verses here. Behold, Paul is saying this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, here we go again, sleep, but we shall all be changed. Love it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that word there in the Greek is atmos, atmos where we get the word Adam. It's just very small. Very, and, just, and just like, boop, just in a millisecond of time, it's, everything is going to change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. In other words, we as a believer, we're going to be raised into a glorified body. Your soul and your spirit are going to be reuniting with your body. And you're going to be raised, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed amen for this corruptible this flesh must put on incorruption a glorified state and this mortal our flesh will put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortal but Paul he's really he's he is hammering he's hammering that nail in because he wants them to get this. He wants us to get this. I don't know how many times he's, he's going to say it here. Three or four times. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Isn't that powerful? Death is swallowed up in victory. The victory of what? The victory that Christ won on the cross over the devil. Okay? And so victory, our, our death is now swallowed up to be no more. So that's a very powerful uh, scripture there. Now, let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit. So Paul's aspirations were to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And that should be our, our aspirations. Our aspiration is to know Christ that every day that we're changed more into the image of Christ, somorphous in, in the Greek, to be changed into the same image as of. And so we, we should be every day, Lord, we want to be more like Christ. We want to be like Jesus. And, we, and then to know the power of his resurrection. And this is what he says in Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That was his goal. Because without the res resurrection, Christianity is quite dead. So because of that, because of the hope of the to be more like Christ and the hope of the resurrection, it affected how he lived. It affected how Apostle Paul lived. He says, I have hope in God that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. See, the, ju the unjust are going to be resurrected one day too. And that's at the end of the judgment, at the end of the age, at the great, great white throne judgment where Jesus is going to be dividing the sheep from the goats. So they're going to be resurrected in the future also. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense. So in other words, it affects how you live. Because of this, you know that you're going to be resurrected. You're going to be judged. You want to have a good conscience toward men, toward God and man. It affects the way we live. It should affect the way we live. There's a sobriety here. There's a gravitas here to what Paul is saying. Now, so here's the, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I, I talked about the near end, the physical death for all of us, eternity, heaven and hell, and the resurrection. That is, that is the near end for us as believers. But also, I want to talk about now the far end, if you will. I want to talk about 
the end times in the future. And if you get into the book of Revelation, and when you do get into the book of Revelation, uh, you'll be reading these things. And so <laughs> I by no means am giving, a giving, I'm going to give you a breakdown of, of the book of Revelation. So I just, I can't do that. I, I mean, I, there's not enough time. I can't do that in this little bit of time. And it's so complicated. There's so many angles. There's so many thoughts. There's so many uh, different ideas about how things and beliefs, how things are supposed to play, play out. But what I want to do is I want to give you just a brief description of some of the major events that you'll hear about. You might hear about it on the news. You might hear about it on Christian, te Christian television or some article pops up on social media, you know, 666 or Armageddon, the apocalypse. You'll hear these things. And, uh, and so I, and where does that come from? The book of Revelation. And so uh, as a Christian, I, I think it's important for you to have a little sense uh, of what these things are. You don't have to be the expert or anything. You just have some sense of what they, so I want to give you kind of a brief description of some of these key events that are going to take place. And the, I'm not going to give you a timeline or anything like that. Because uh, <laughs> there's so many different beliefs uh, about, you know, when does this happen? When does that happen? And, and people get really heated up about it and get, you know, I mean, just get, they almost break fellowship and some do break fellowship over this. And so we don't want to do that. Here's the thing. We just want to be ready when he comes. Occupy till he comes. We want to be, just be ready. Just be, just, just, just be like those that have, that have got their lamps lit and they're waiting, waiting for the bridegroom. Just be ready. That's all you have. But there's some things that, that are, that are going to take place. It is, it is canonized in the 66 books of the Bible. It is a book we should read. And, uh, and so, it's, so here's some things that you're going to hear about. Uh, so uh, I'm a, I'm a, there, there's the book of Revelation. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then there, there's the seven churches. You may have heard about that or the rapture or the tribulation, the seven seals, the trumpets and the bowls. What in the world is that? The Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, the millennium, the great right throne judgment, Hades and the lake of fire. What's that? The new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem. Now, I want to start right off and just give you a little bit about the book of, uh, of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus uh, was given to the Apostle John. Okay, so the Apostle John uh, was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, which was a Greek isle just off the west coast of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And he was, he was exiled on, on that island. And on one Sunday, Sunday one, uh, uh, he was on that island, on, and he heard a voice. And he was walking, he said, I, on the Lord's day, he was walking on the Lord's day and he heard a voice behind him. And all of a sudden he turned and fell down as a dead man. And, this, and all of a sudden, uh, one like the son of man was in the seven golden uh, candlesticks and Jesus began to give him a word. He began to reveal uh, the last things. He, first of all, he wanted to give a, a word to the churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor. So the book of Revelation was given to John to give to the seven churches. It's a word to the seven churches that are there. And we're, I'll, I'll give you those seven churches. And so it's the revelation of Jesus. It's not the revelation of John. John recorded it, but it's the revelation of Jesus, the words of Jesus to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And so he was exiled there, political prisoner uh, on the Greek Isle of Patmos. It was written, some, some say, around 96, 98 D, somewhere right around the end of the, of the first century there. And the purpose was to address the state of the churches and future events. Some of those, uh, some of the, most of those churches were not in a good place. They were not, and they needed to be rebuked. And, and that's, that's so, and, and so Christ loved them so much, he wanted to give them a rebuke, but also tell them, hey, get your act together because there's, there's things coming that you need to know about, okay? And so anyway, it's to, get, it is to keep the churches in a state of readiness. And so those words were true back then, they're true today. So those words not only were for, that, for those churches, those seven churches, but they also echo throughout all the centuries to us today. And so when we read those words, when I read those words, I'm going like, ooh, I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be like this and spit out a cry. I don't want that. And so, so it's, it keeps us in a state of readiness. Now, this is a really cool thing. 
in the book of Revelation, right, off, right in the first, first uh, few verses there, and verse three, uh, there's a blessing of the revelation. There's a blessing given. And here, is, here it is. In first, and here's the verse, Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. We all have the near end, but there's a far end, a far, a far end coming, okay? Because the time is near. And so we see, and it, here's the thing, it doesn't say you have to understand it all. It's impossible. Well, all those pictures and it's just like, what, those word pictures, what are those things? It's, it, you don't have to understand it all. And there's been some great scholars that have really broken it down and done a great job, which is like really incredible. They have a gift for that. It doesn't say you have to understand it. You just have to read it, to hear it, and to keep it. And if you do those things, there's a blessing attached to that. I'll take that. Now, the seven churches, he goes right off in, in, in chapters two and three, and he talks about these, he talks, this is Jesus now talking to the seven churches. And here's, here's the things that he challenged them with. The church at Ephesus, the first one. You, they rejected evil and they left their first love. Wow. That can talk to us today. We can get so caught up in everything else. God changed, Christ changed our lives, but we kind of get going in life and we can become lukewarm. We can become, become lukewarm, we've, or we've left our first love. Smyrna, they suffered persecution and prison and Pergamus. They tolerated heresies and sexual immorality. And Thyatira, they tolerated idolatry and sexual immorality again. We see the, the Sardis church. They, the, Christ called them a dead church. Boy, I don't, want, I don't want Christ calling us a dead church. or I don't want to be dead anything. So a dead church. But he said, though, silver lining, their remnant remains. I want to be a Philadelphia church. They have kept the faith and Christ called them overcomers. They were over, they were the overcoming church. I want, we want our church to be an overcoming church. And so we want to live as, as Christians, as overcomers. We want to be Philadelphian, if you will. The Laodicean church, they were lukewarm and indifferent. Christ said he'd spit them out. So these are words of warning and correction given to the, to the to, uh, given then and to all churches to us today. So that, those are the seven churches. And, and you can go and read about that in the book of Revelation. I want to talk a little bit about the rapture because you hear a lot about that. And there's a lot of ideas about, you know, is there a rapture? Some don't believe there's a rapture. Some do believe there's a rapture. Sometimes scripture seems to bear that out. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding, a lot, of, a lot of thoughts about when is the rapture? Is it, is, it, is it before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation? Or there's no one, it's not a rapture at all. But the best we can see from Scripture, it seems that it points to a rapture. And, and we believe that. And, and I personally believe that there is a rapture. And we teach that. And we can see it, see it in Scripture. And, uh, and so if it's not a rapture, it's like we think it is. Well, so be it. I just want to be ready. <laughs> I just want to be ready. So the main biblical proof text that we see about the rapture in Scripture uh, is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It's, and it's, this is the verse where, where we get the word rapture. It's a Latin word. Then we who are alive and remain, shall be, talking about believers, shall be caught up. People that are born again, they're, they're Philadelphian. They're overcomers. They're the Philadelphian church, okay? And so those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Who's them in the clouds? The Bible says that the dead, that when this, 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 this trumpet sounds and there's a clear sound and the rapture takes place, that the dead in Christ, just before this verse, those that, are born, that have, were born again and they had died, they're resurrected first. And they're already in the air. And that we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them. Well, that would be a cool thing. I would, that would be a cool thing to have. I would like that. That's pretty cool. So they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always, after that, and then here we go, you're in the hands of the Lord. And after that, we'll always be with the Lord. Forever. That's it. We're forever with the Lord. Isn't that cool? 
Now, where do we get the word rapture? Where, where, how's, how, how did people come up with that? Okay. Well, the word rapture is, it's, it's the Latin word, and it was written in St. Jerome's Bible, his Latin Bible, and it's uh, rapiemur. And I'm probably not saying that right, but I think that's kind of how it goes. Rapiemur. And it means we are caught up or we are taken away. It means caught up or taken away. And so that's where, that's, that's where it caught up. It was the Latin word here is rapiemur. And, and so that's where the word, the English word we get, rapture, okay? So uh, you might hear, you might, somebody might ask you that. So there it is. And so here's the cool thing uh, for those that do believe in the rapture is that, is that if, you, if you do believe in the rapture, it says, and we can make a little bit of in, uh, inference here, and to what, and out of 1 Thessalonians, and to wait for his son from heaven, okay, we're waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So uh, a lot of Bible scholars believe that they believe in the rapture because, that they, because why would God put his children through wrath? And they we're gonna be kept from the wrath to come. And so uh, I like that. That's a pretty cool thing. I don't want to go through, I don't want to go through the tribulation. Now, uh, a little bit more about the tribulation, and this is a little bit of a breakdown, but um, we're, so a lot, you read in Daniel about the 70th week, okay? And I don't have a timeline, but I'm not going to put a timeline because I don't want to put timelines up here, uh, but because but, I'm just giving you definitions. But if, you, if we're reading scripture and you hear, you'll read in Daniel the 70th week. What is that? That 70th week is referring to the future time where there's going to be a tribulation. And, and, and the way that it was described in the book of Daniel, it was weeks of years. So one week was seven years. Okay. So the 70th week will be seven years sometime in the future. And you, as you, when you read scripture, you can, you can pretty much see that that's the tribulation period. And 69 weeks have already passed. And when did, when, did it, when, did it, when did the calendar start for that? Okay. What started in 445 BC with the command of the Persian king Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. So in 445 BC, the command gang came out down to, uh, to build the temple. And, and the prophecy to Daniel in the book of Daniel was when you hear that command, start, start, turn the hourglass over. And so there were 69 weeks of years, 483 years, and it led all the way up to 32 AD when Christ was crucified. And at that time, now we're kind of in a pause period. So 69 weeks of years from 445 BC all the way to when Christ was crucified, uh, that was the end of that period. So there's a gap. So currently we're in a pause or a grace period of the time most Bible scholars call the church age. The church age, age began at Christ, Christ's uh, at crucifixion and his resurrection. And we're living in that today. It's the grace period for the last 2,000 years or so. We've been living in this grace period. So the 69 weeks ended and now we're in this grace period. And some future time, the 70th week of Daniel will begin the seven years of tribulation. So we're now in this period and it's called the church age. So the 70th week to come is called the tribulation period when God's wrath, his divine wrath, uh, will be poured out upon the earth and all mankind. There's, a lot, there's been a lot of human wrath that has taken place, unfortunately, over the last 2,000 years. But this is a different type of wrath. This is a, this is a divine wrath. This is a holy wrath that's going to come uh, from God. Another thing you'll hear and you'll read about, you read about this in the book of Revelation, uh, and, uh, is, are the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. You, you'll read about those things. And these, the, every, every seal, every trumpet is blast, blasted or sounded, and every bowl that is poured out, these are different types of wrath that God brings upon, upon the earth, the judgment uh, on the earth. So God's great and terrible wrath is poured out on the earth in succession over a seven-year uh, period, and it, it increases in intensity. I know one thing. I don't want to be here, and, and, it inflicts, and it's inflicted on various parts of the earth and its people, and we read about it from Revelation 6 
to chapter 16. So there's ten, basically 10 chapters there of wrath. And, 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 this, and, this, and, the Reve, and the tribulation period, you can read it in the book of Daniel. You can also read it in the book of Revela, Revelation. And you can see that it talks about two, three and a half year periods. And Daniel, it talks about a time, which is one year, a times, which is two years, one plus two is three, and a half of time, a half of a year. And that's three and a half years. So the best, the best we can tell and what scripture says is that the tribula tribulation period is broken down in two, three and a half year periods or 42, two 42 month periods. And so that's the seven seals and the seven trumpets. And that leads us up to uh, the Antichrist, okay? At some point, and I'm not getting into all the details of this, but at some point, the Antichrist is gonna begin to emerge. He's going to cut a covenant with Jerusalem. He's going to allow them to do, to reignite the, the sacrifice, the Levitical sacrificial system. Uh, they're going to begin to rebuild the temple and they're going to rebuild the temple. And so he's going to appear as, as the friend of the Jewish people. And he's going to be a charismatic geopolitical leader who unifies all people under a one, one, one world governmental system. So he's going to have the gift to speak, communicate, and he is just going to be just dynamic and charismatic. And people are going to fall in love with this guy. They're just going to fall in love, love with him. But here's the thing. In the Bible, he's the beast. Okay. He's the great beast. And he's also called the beast. And, and this is what the Bible says, okay? This is what it says. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 and 4, it says, All the world, all the world marveled and followed the beast. Wow. That's, that's amazing. All, and they followed this guy. So they worshiped the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast. So they worship the Antichrist, the beast. He's also called the, the Antichrist, the beast, the, interchangeably. And the dragon, the Satan, is giving power to this guy, and he started worshiping Satan. And so, uh, they give, and so he gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is like this man? He's unbelievable. Who is able to make, and who is able to go against him? Who's able to make war with this guy? Nobody. So the whole world is falling in love with this guy. The false prophet is the second beast. Okay, so there's, there's the dragon who is Satan. You got the Antichrist, which is the beast. And then you got the false prophet. And the Bible also calls him the second beast. And he is quite a character, Okay. So basically, remember, Satan always tries, he tries to counterfeit everything God does, he tries to copycat everything God does. And so he's really the, count, so you have a counterfeit satanic trinity here. You got Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, a counterfeit trinity. And the whole world is just worshiping the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, that was the Antichrist. And there's a lot there, but that's all I'm going to give you right there. And this is another one that you hear about a lot. Oh, the mark of the beast, 666. You hear that a lot. <laughs> I mean, I've heard this so many times. Even growing, when I was kind of in, in college and high school, uh, some of you will remember this, when they started putting the barcode on all the, all the items that, in the grocery store. And that started back like in the 80s, in the early 80s, maybe in the late 70s. Some, and they started putting that and people going like, oh my God, that's the mark of the beast. And oh my God. And then now you, and so, and nobody, we didn't even know what it was. I, it was just on, on the package. And we, did, we didn't know quite what it, what, what it was. And then all of a sudden, then, then, then they had, that had the infra, had the, the 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 laser that the laser readers and it started reading. Go like, oh, okay, that's 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 so you can check out a lot easier. But everybody was saying it's the mark of the beast, you know. So we don't know exactly. It's not going to be like that. The Bible tells it explicitly what it is, but what is it really? We don't know. And so uh, the mark of the beast six six six. We do know that for a fact. Uh, that's scripture. So the prophet. The false prophet, he mandates, the he mandates Antichrist worship. So the false prophet is the Antichrist's big cheerleader. So he's going around all the world and he's, 
and he's, he's promoting the Antichrist and he's causing people to, to worship this guy. And so and he, he performs great signs to get people to believe in the Antichrist. So he's performing these great signs, the Bible says in Revelation 13, 13. And he goes even further than that. He builds an image and a statue to the Antichrist. So he builds a false, he builds this, this statue. It reminds me of Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. He built a statue to himself, 90 feet tall or 100 feet tall. And everybody had to bow down and worship. The same spirit. The devil has no new tricks. It's the same thing. The same thing as it was in the Old Testament. And so now this big statue is erected. And it's a statue, and, he, and here's the thing. And he makes the dead statue come to life, and this statue begins speaking. Can you imagine? If it was made out of stone, all of a sudden the stone begins to speak, and people go like, oh, they're just amazed. How can dead things speak? And so he's winning these people over, and they're so and they're so blinded. It's terrible. And he forces, he forces all the people, the false prophet forces all the people to receive the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead. And without the mark, the Bible says in Revelation 13, 16, no one may buy or sell. So in other, in other words, to do any type of commerce, buy groceries or whatever, buy a car, whatever, you have to have this mark or you're out. You can't buy anything. And the number of the beast is 666. That's Revelation 13, 18. So that is the mark of the beast. Another thing you hear a lot about, you'll hear is the battle of Armageddon. And the battle of Armageddon, as we read from scripture, is... Is, 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 is at the end of the tribulation period, at the end of the seven-year period. And so uh, this, this great battle is going to take place. It occurs near the end of the seven-year tribulation and the military forces of the Antichrist and the false prophets. So they're gathering all the armies of the earth, okay? We, and they're gathering these armies. Uh, and, and so and they're, they're going to have a big battle at the Valley of Megiddo. Most people believe that's where it's going to be, the Valley of Megiddo in Israel. I've been there. I've seen it. It's this huge valley. When you're on top of Mount Carmel, you see it. And, and it's, it's, that's, where the, that's where the battle's going to be. And it says here in Revelation 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the air and their armies, I mean the kings of the earth and their armies, and they gathered together to make war against him who sat on the, on, on, on the horse and against his army. Revelation 19, 19. And so the beast, the false prophet, and the armies are soundly defeated by the second coming of Jesus. And when, that, when you begin to see the armies, so when those armies begin to come together and they're gathering in the valley of Armageddon, Armageddon Jesus is about to return back the second time, planting his feet on the Mount of Olives, the Bible says. And so that's when he comes down for good and he soundly defeats all those armies the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so that's when Christ comes down. It's in the rapture, he come, we're caught up and Jesus meets, meets us in the air. And then we're, we continue to go. So he comes down and he goes right back up. He doesn't touch the earth. But in the second coming, he comes and he's coming down to defeat the armies, plant himself on the Mount of Olives, and he sets up a new kingdom. He sets up a new kingdom, which is really cool. He goes, that's the next thing. Now, that's the battle of Armageddon. And so now we're at the second coming of Christ. This is when Christ comes at the battle. He defeats all those. And this occurs at the end of the tribulation period. And Jesus describes his second coming in Matthew chapter 24. And verse 21, he says this, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall there ever be. And verse 29, 30 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. That's Jesus coming in from heaven, coming down from heaven. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he's going to come and he's going to wipe them out. Praise God, right? So that's the second coming of Christ. And that tees up 
the millennial reign of Christ. So Christ comes down, defeats the armies. He defeats the Antichrist. He defeats the false prophet. And he comes down and he sets up his kingdom and the millennial reign of Christ. And what is the millennial reign? Millennial, meaning a thousand. So Satan is bound. The Bible says Satan is bound and cast into the bottomless pit pit for a thousand years, Revelation 20, 22 and 3. So Satan, he takes Satan and he throws him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And we have a thousand year reign of Christ. Christ is going to be here on earth. The earth that we see right now. And he's going to establish a new government. The Bible says in Zechariah 14, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. There'll be neither night or day. Isn't that beautiful? So during that, during that thousand years, year reign of Christ, some interesting things are going to happen to the present day earth. There's going to be a new climate. Deserts will blossom. Disease will be non-existent. The animal kingdom, the appetites begin to change. Look at this scripture right here. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Wow. So the appetites change. Things are going to be different. Things are always different when Christ is around, right? And then after that period for a thousand years, the Bible says that Satan's going to be loose for a, due, for a season because a men have to choose Christ on their own because there's, there's people that are going to, we're, we're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ in that thousand year reign. But there's people that are going to be on the earth still that are going to go through this thousand year reign of Christ. So Satan is released because he, because every, every person has to be a free will, they're a free will moral agent. And so they have to freely receive Christ, not that just because he was, the, he was the leader, but Christ wants people to make a choice. So Satan is loose and he deceives like he always does. He deceives some people. He gathers people again together, uh, again together. Just like, he, just like he gathered one third of the angels in heaven, he's now going around deceiving people again. And he's gonna have an army that's gonna try to come and usurp once again Christ. You would think, duh, hello, uh, wake up. He never learns his lesson. He's pretty dense. And so he's going to be loose. And then in one final fail swoop, Christ is going to destroy him forever. So Satan is defeated in the final battle and thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible calls that Gehenna. And a lake of fire uh, and where, along with the beast and the false prophet. They're already there in the lake of fire. So he throws them in. And so the satanic, I mean, the satanic trinity, they can, they can, hell out forever. I was going to say chill out, but hell out. But it's anyway. Okay, now, Revelation 20. And the fire came, so here's the proof text. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. All these armies that that were trying to come against Jesus. The devil who who deceived them was, was cast into the lake of fire. And the false prophet and the Antichrist are already there. So that's the great white throne judgment. And so, and so in the great white throne judgment, judgment, Jesus is sitting on the throne. So here he is. He's already gone through the thousand year millennial reign. Okay. And we haven't got to the good part yet. Okay. So we've already gone through the thousand year reign. Christ, uh, uh, the devil is defeated. He's thrown, he's thrown into the lake of fire. And now... Christ sits at the great right throne judgment. And this is where he, his edict comes forth for those that are separated from him. And when they're separated from him, that's what the Bible calls the second death. And that's the most dreaded death. So Jesus is now sitting on a throne. He will judge all the wicked from the beginning of man's history. Those who refuse to believe in God and his son. Their names are written what the Bible calls books. These are different books. This is not the book, the Lamb's book of life. These are other books, other books than the book of life. And scripture says, and I saw the dead. This is John, John speaking. And I saw the dead and the dead were judged according to their works. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This, this is scripture. In verse 15, Revelation 20, 15, this is the second death. It's one thing to be, quote, fearful of the first death, your physical death, but it's a dreaded thing and a whole nother matter, the second death. 
And you don't want to experience that. And that's why we're so gripped in our last lesson to go and tell people about Jesus, right? There's a reason why we want to tell people about Jesus because of everything we're talking about right now. This, this is reality. This is not mythical. This is, this is literal. These are literal places. This is a literal future I'm talking about here. The Bible's talking about it. The eternal death of the soul is the most dreaded. And so that's the great white throne judgment. We as believers, when we, when we were caught up in the air in the rapture and, met, and we're meeting with Christ, uh, or we, we passed on into eternity, we're already with Christ in heaven. And he's going to judge us, what's called the Bema Seat Judgment. He's going to receive us what we do with Jesus. So it's, not, it's nothing, it's, it's just, we have rewards and greater rewards. <laughs> It's rewards and greater rewards and maybe greater rewards, depending on what you did with Jesus. Okay, so it's not a bad thing. Okay, so there's, there's a judgment we've already gone through. Okay, but this is for the wicked, the unrighteous, those, the unbelievers, those that are not born again. All right? And so when you see in Scripture, Hades and the lake of fire, uh, Hades, you'll see these kind of used interchangeably at times. Gehenna, uh, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, Hades is the temporal abode of the unsaved until the final judgment at the great white throne judgment. So that's the temporal abode, like Abraham's bosom, okay? Uh, Hades and hell are used interchangeably in scripture. Death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire at the end, cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. And that's the final victory, that's it. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire and they were, they're not to be anymore. Praise God. The lake of fire is the final place of judgment, destruction, and torment for the devil, the beast, the false prophet, and the unsaved. The lake of fire and Gehenna are sometimes used interchangeably. Hell, Hades, and Gehenna, and the lake of fire are real, physical, eternal. Why did I do that slide? Because you hear all these terms uh, in, in your walk with the Lord and you read about them. Okay, so they're, they're basically all kind of Gehenna and the Lake of Fire are the same. Hades and hell, they're the same. Okay, so, but it, it all speaks of a separation from God. And that's, that's what we don't want. All right. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the fun part, okay, as a believer. So there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth in our future. A new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the earth are destroyed. God makes a new heaven and a new earth. There's no more sea in it. And as we read this in Revelation chapter 21, we're almost to the end. There's only one more chapter of the whole Bible. And it's Revelation 22. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So how that's gonna happen, we don't know. Because remember the Bible said, eye has not seen nor ear has heard what the Lord has in store for us. So this, these are things that we're going to be surprised about. But, but there's going to be a new, her, a new heaven. There's a new earth that we're going to walk into. And it's, it's going to be amazing. And the Bible says there's no more sea. And so the overcomers, remember the Philadelphia church? They were overcomers. They were, they were, accommodated, they were accommodated because of their, they were overcomers. The overcomers shall inherit all things. I didn't say that. Scripture says that. Revelation 21, 7 says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son or daughter. Isn't that cool? Isn't that really cool? And that's not, that's not the final. So we have a new heaven. We have a new earth. And there's going to be a new Jerusalem. The holy city. Okay. The holy city, New Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. We see that used interchangeably in Revelation chapter 21. They talk about the, the, uh, the New Jerusalem and the lamb, the, bride, the lamb and his bride. And you see the holy city and Jerusalem used interchangeably. So the best we can see is the place where we live. We're gonna, it's, it's named after us, if you will. Uh, so the bride of Christ, the holy city. We are the holy bride of Christ. In Revelation 20, verse 2, it says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. We're the bride. So somehow that's interchanged. So this is going to be a real place, a New Jerusalem, and we're going to be there, and we're going to reside in that city. 
as a bride adorned for her husband. Who's the husband? Jesus. And in verse nine, it says, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Wow, that's amazing. The holy city is the church's future eternal dwelling place. And God will, Bible says in verse four, God will wipe away every tear. There's no more crying. There's no more tear. There's no death. It's just an amazing place to be. And finally, we see the final words of Jesus in the whole Bible. He said, surely I am coming quickly. And sometimes we, we, say, we, we tell Jesus, uh, you can't do that soon enough. <laughs> but isn't that cool? He goes, he, he, he just assures us, hey, I know you're going through a lot. I know it's a lot you're going through with your family, with your kids, your husband, your spouse, or whatever, your job, your relationships, your business. There's a lot you're going through. There's a lot you're having to endure. You're having to endure. It's not easy living on planet Earth. It's not. But he says, listen, don't worry. Surely I am coming quickly. I love those words. So that, is, that sums it all up. And uh, for all of our lessons we've gone through, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking with you, being with you, and just uh, helping you along uh, in your walk with Christ. And I hope you would take these things and just don't go like, okay, that's it. No, there's a, there's a lot more to it. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's just your beginning. And so, as, so I am encourage you to get in the Word, get in Scripture, read, dig, uh, just keep moving, be around people, get in a small group. Be accountable. All those fun things we talked about. Go tell people about Jesus and all these cool things. And, uh, and you will live a very fulfilled Christian life. Very fulfilled. And so it's been a blessing to be with you. Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray for each and every person uh, that endured to the end of these lessons. Lord, I pray that you would just bless them, keep them, watch over them, Lord. May your face shine favor upon them, upon their family, Lord. Use them mightily in the earth. Use them mightily on their job, Father Lord. Use them as a witness to a world that is lost and dying and separated from you. Father, we pray for this world, Lord. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We go forth and just convict of sin and unrighteousness, Lord. We pray right now that you would move upon this earth in Jesus' name. Bless every person now. Amen and amen. All right, I love you. And we'll see you later. God bless.